Next on Currents News, a major milestone in the fight against coronavirus. 70% of all New Yorkers have received at least one coronavirus vaccine. Governor Andrew Cuomo is calling for celebrations. I'm Emily Druby, and coming up, I'll have more on what this means for restrictions. Plus, President Biden speaks with leaders from the European Union ahead of his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. DACA recipients are marking nine years since the program was founded, allowing migrants brought here as children to stay in the country. And turning tragedy into hope, a Catholic woman gifts scholarships in the name of her late son to keep his legacy alive. The news starts right now. It is the national goal and we hit it ahead of schedule. Governor Andrew Cuomo announcing New York State has vaccinated 70% of its population. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. Fireworks will light up the night sky in honor of the accomplishment. The governor is relaxing restrictions and mandates statewide, saying New York has the highest vaccination rate in the country. Currents News' Emily Druby has more about what this means for individual New Yorkers. Give New Yorkers a round of applause. A major milestone, 70% of New York adults partially vaccinated. Now over 400 days since the state shut down, it's set to reopen. What does 70% mean? It means that we can now return to life as we know it. The governor announcing almost all state mandated COVID restrictions have been lifted. That means no more social distancing or gathering limits for many places like camps, gyms, movie theaters and sports venues. No health screenings or contact tracing protocols. Private businesses can impose stricter standards if they want to. But CDC restrictions, including masks, are still in place for health care and correctional facilities, schools, public transit and homeless shelters. This is a momentous day. And uh, we deserve it because it has been a long, long road. For adults with at least one vaccine, the city is at 68.4%, but some neighborhoods are still well under 50%. According to the most recent city data, some of the neighborhoods with the lowest vaccination rates in the Diocese of Brooklyn include Canarsie, Rosedale, Flatlands Midwood, Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Far Rockaway. All are under 45%. During a recent interview, health care officials from the Joseph P. Adabo Family Health Center in Far Rockaway said accessibility and vaccine education were part of the issue. They stressed the importance of reaching out for information. Come in and speak with someone and get an informed opinion. Um, that's the most important part. Don't listen to what you see on the Internet. It's obvious there's still work to do when you look at some of the numbers in these neighborhoods. Even Governor Cuomo saying that we're still in this fight, but the state hit a major milestone. And Tuesday night, there'll be a moment of celebration. Fireworks will ring out across the state and landmarks will be lit in blue and gold. A tribute to the strength and resilience of New York. On the Upper West Side, Emily Druby, Currents News. And don't forget, you can catch those fireworks tonight in honor of hitting the 70% threshold. They will go off tonight at 9.15 in New York Harbor. A Texas judge throws out a lawsuit against a hospital over its COVID vaccine requirements. Nearly 200 employees were suspended for not getting fully vaccinated as required by Houston Methodist Hospital. The lawsuit said the mandate goes too far and violates personal autonomy, calling the vaccines experimental and dangerous. The judge sided with the hospital, saying those claims about the vaccine are untrue. Meanwhile, President Biden is set to pitch in 500 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine to help address the global vaccine shortage. This comes after calls from Catholic leaders for vaccinations for underdeveloped nations. The international correspondent for the tablet and Crux, John Lavenberg, spoke to Currents News about a recent declaration sent by bishops to world leaders. They talk about the fact that a lot of countries across the world aren't really out of the woods yet when it comes to the pandemic. Um, a lot of countries still have high numbers, high transmission rates, and they really called on um, the U.S. and the European countries and the leadership in those countries to, to get that, their vaccines and accelerate the process 
of getting vaccines to these countries. They really called on the leaders in these countries and said that when they work in a productive way, it can really go a long way in helping global solidarity. Um, they mentioned things, labor rights, um, violence around the world, in addition to the, the vaccines. Um, they talked about a myriad of issues that they think these, these countries can be leaders in. The bishop suggested using programs such as the global initiative COVAX to ensure the equitable access of vaccines for all. President Biden's overseas trip is in the final stretch with a major agenda item on deck. Biden will meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday, a showdown expected to tackle heavy topics like nuclear security and cyber attacks at a time when U.S.-Russia relations are at a low point. Karen Kafa reports. President Joe Biden arriving in Geneva on the heels of his effort to reaffirm U.S. relationships with European allies at the G7 and NATO summits. One of his goals, walk into a summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin Wednesday with that Western solidarity behind him. We share a long history with the United States. We shaped much of the last century and now it's time to shape this century. Biden has said he may seek some common ground with Putin, things like climate change and Iran's nuclear program. But cyber attacks originating in Russia are also expected to be raised. It's still unclear whether they will discuss the jailing of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny and other dissidents and the imprisonment of U.S. nationals in Russia. That's where U.S.-Russia observers say Biden needs to talk tough with Putin. He's at war with Western standards, Western norms, and he's flaunting his power. So President Biden can deal with him with respect. But he can't sugarcoat that. Atlantic. Most agree the meeting won't bring big immediate outcomes, but Biden can set a tone. The best that you know President Biden can do is telegraph that he's he is full of resolve, you know, that his government is is resolved to respond if the Russians continue, that there will be consequences. U.S. officials expect Wednesday's meeting to last between four and five hours or longer. Unlike his predecessor, Donald Trump, after the 2018 Helsinki summit, Biden won't hold a joint press conference with Putin after. In Washington, Karen Kafa, Currents News. The U.S. CCB's virtual conference is also set for Wednesday. President Biden will be the center of discussion as they study the issue of pro-choice politicians receiving communion. John Lavenberg will be following along and will have full reports on both Currents News and the tablet. Today marks nine years since DACA, or Deferred Action Against Childhood Arrivals, was created. The policy allows undocumented immigrants who enter the U.S. as children to remain in the country. The so-called DREAMers don't get legal status through DACA or a pathway to citizenship, but they are eligible for work authorization and other benefits. The U.S. Bishop's Migrant Committee chairman is calling for relief for the DREAMers, saying... As a church, we recognize the inherent God-given dignity of every human person, regardless of immigration status. Therefore, we will continue to call for comprehensive immigration reform that preserves family unity, honors due process, respects the rule of law, and addresses the root causes of migration consistent with the common good. Turning now to the weather, as a dangerous heat wave bakes much of the western part of the U.S., that, on top of drought conditions, is a recipe for disaster as wildfires rage in several states. And as Britt Conway reports, firefighters worry they're in for another brutal wildfire season. Fire after fire after fire. Thousands of acres have been scorched in the western U.S. with no relief in sight. We're easily a month or more ahead of uh, fire weather conditions for this time of year. In fact, from the beginning of this year through June 11th, more than 833,000 acres have burned in nearly 27,000 fires across the U.S. During that same period last year, it was just over 658,000 acres in more than 20,000 fires. That's according to the National Interagency Fire Center, which is also tracking 25 large fires in eight states right now. Arizona, New Mexico, Florida, Utah, Oregon, Nevada, Wyoming, and California. Seven of those large fires are in Arizona, including the Telegraph Fire, which has burned more than 100,000 acres. There have been evacuations in parts of the state and in California, too. So many fires in so many places presents a significant challenge. 
a system of resources it becomes strained when multiple regions are active, um, like we're starting to see already. Making things worse, drought and heat. The areas experiencing extreme drought are bracing for intense heat now, too. By the end of the week, more than 250 heat records could be tied, fueling the fire, literally. We reach a point across multiple western states where there's no matter how many we have, there's not enough fire engines to put one in every driveway. I'm Britt Conway reporting. Israel's new government is getting to work after being sworn in by a very thin margin. Israel's ousted Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is attacking the new government, led by his former chief of staff turned rival, Neftali Bennett. The new Prime Minister is promising a government that works after more than two years of political dysfunction. The new coalition is the most diverse in Israeli history, with left wing and far right party members sitting alongside the first. Arab Israeli party in government. There's a lot more news headed your way, turning their loss into someone else's gain, how a Queens couple is keeping their son's memory alive. Plus, a new statue of the patron saint of lost things will tell you where you can find it. And Notre Dame needs your help bringing the cathedral back to life after that devastating fire comes with a big price tag. We have the plans. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. After their 42-year-old son died from cancer, a Queens couple decided to keep his memory alive. In the four years he's been gone, they created a foundation to give scholarships to students at his former Catholic schools. Currents News' Emily Druby has more from Howard Beach. The scholarships are awarded to Genesis Camellia and Trevor Beer. $1,000 scholarships for two graduating St. Elizabeth Catholic Academy students. Big money, inspired by big loss. When went to Vela, Victorian Trevor Beer. It definitely is a good feeling getting a scholarship, especially from that cause. The cause, a family's love for their late son. He was our best friend. It's hard. It's still hard. The hardest thing in the world. In 2017, Helen DiPietra lost her only child, William. A brain tumor took the 42-year-old's life. Oh, here's a nice picture. Pieces of him still fill her home. A photo of his FDNY EMT uniform, a Star Wars figurine, one of many he collected, handwritten notes from the film he was working on. Pieces of Bill's legacy. Everything's just as he left it. In the four years he's been gone, his mother created another legacy, the William F. DiPietro Foundation, inspired by an award given out by his film grad school, LIU. I said, we should do something like that. So they did, starting the foundation, using private donations and money from selling Bill's many collectibles to help fund it. The foundation supports two of Bill's loves, FDNY causes, and the arts, scholarships, and grants for the places he went to school, including St. Elizabeth's, targeting filmmakers, drama clubs, and students involved in the arts. I feel like Bill's Catholic education, his Catholic upbringing, made him the person that he was. And I, I just try to, to carry on the way he would want me to. Helen taught at St. Elizabeth's for 29 years. It's where she met now principal Jean Shannon. Her whole purpose in life is to support this foundation and to secure her son's legacy. In only three years, the foundation has given out about $50,000. It's sad sometimes, but I just, I know he'd be proud of me. With her son close to her heart, Helen has turned one of the greatest tragedies in life into a lasting legacy. In Howard Beach, Queens, Emily Druby, Currents News. For more information on how to donate, visit WFDFound.com. The Diocese of Brooklyn also helping kids get a Catholic school education by hitting the green. The golf outing at West Hampton Country Club hosted by Futures in Education, an organization that looks to provide assistance to the neediest of students through endowment funds and fundraising programs. Every year, Futures gives out about $8 million in scholarships. This event raised about 200000 
School's out for summer. Another year for students is now in the books, but it was anything but ordinary. Undergraduate college enrollment fell again this spring, another 5% with students across the country not able to afford or not wanting to pay for remote experiences. But that's not the story of one college in the Diocese of Brooklyn, St. Joseph's. Financial aid budgets actually increased there. I asked the president, Donald Boomgarden, how the school was able to pull this feat off during COVID. Our professors really rose to the occasion and made sure that their classes online were engaging and exciting to the degree they could. And uh, uh, the work that we did to keep the students tied to us in that way proved to be really effective because then over the summer we actually were able to hold on to our students and we even had a good fall recruiting session for the first year students uh, one of the things i also did i froze tuition and i also took out a number of fees so that students uh, were not as challenged financially to come to st joseph's now we're already a very reasonable school but that made us even more reasonable. So those are a couple of the things that we did that allowed us to thrive uh, in a really difficult environment. Great, I wanna look at some, the breakdown of St. Joseph's affordability is part of the school's mission. It has one of the lowest tuitions for an independent college in the New York City area. 99% of students at the Brooklyn campus receive some form of financial aid. And like we mentioned, financial aid budgets have only gone up due to COVID. The college was able to disperse nearly $4 million in federal aid and over 100,000 in emergency aid. So what has been the response from students during this? Well, I, I think the, you know, how they say the proof is in the pudding. You know, one of the, one of the things that happened was we've, had a very high retention rate. So we didn't lose a lot of students. So when they received the federal funding, they were able to, if they wished to uh, apply it to their bills, to their college bills. And we even had a special um, giving day, which we do every year. And last year's giving day to the alumni was the creation of a COVID emergency fund for our students. So we used that money, well over $100,000 to help them with things like computers and, and books and, uh, and in some cases food. Uh, and, and, and the really important things in life. So the college reached out to them with this aid and I think the students responded by staying with us uh, and by continuing to, to work hard in a really difficult situation. Also interesting, St. Joseph serves a minority majority population here in New York City. 75% of the students reside within 10 miles of the campus. Many were worried when the pandemic began that disparities would increase and many minority students wouldn't be able to return. Well, that wasn't the case at St. Joseph's. Talk about that. Yes, we have, uh, first of all, we have, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, we're a majority minority campus here in Brooklyn. And um, the diversity of the campus is, is, is astonishing. In other words, we have Hispanic students, we have African American students, we have Asian American students. But we also have students from all over the world. Uh, I teach every year. So uh, in the fall, I taught my course. Uh, I teach a course on uh, American roots music, American folk music. And so I had a student in my class that was from Nepal, and he was literally in Nepal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, had, I had students that were from uh, Guatemala, Ecuador, here living in the city, uh, students from Egypt and from Nigeria. So that the, the student body in Brooklyn is incredibly diverse and exciting. And uh, one of the things with those students, many are first generation. College is a big deal to them and their families. It's, it's a high priority. They, they want to get their degrees. Many of them are working. They had jobs. So um, our, our students uh, that we do have, even though it's a diverse population, we've been really successful in, in, in maintaining them and, of course, in supporting them. So all of these students are receiving various forms of financial aid. The average student in, in, in Brooklyn probably spends uh, no more than fifteen to $16,000 a year, uh, which is you know, a, a price which puts us on the par with any of the state institutions if you add in uh, fees and other costs. That was St. Joseph's College President Donald Boomgarden. A Brooklyn parish now has a new place of
Prayer. Our Lady of Grace Parish in Gravesend, Brooklyn, blessing a new grotto and statue dedicated to St. Anthony. The pastor thanking his flock for donating to the grotto while also praying the patron saint of lost things will continue to bless the church and the school. Notre Dame Cathedral is accepting donations to repair the interior of the iconic building. The Archbishop of Paris is launching a new appeal to restore and modernize the cathedral ahead of its 2024 opening. They're looking for up to 6 million euros for the project. That's a little more than $7 million. More than 85 million euros or $105 million have already been received or pledged for the overall rebuild of the 13th century cathedral which was destroyed by a massive fire in April of 2019. All donations are being accepted through the Friends of Notre Dame de Paris. Still to come on Currents News, something you'd never find in my house, a surplus of Girl Scout cookies. Why boxes and boxes of Thin Mints and Samoas are sitting in a warehouse. And who doesn't love a good bedtime story? One Grandma two. Betty's got one for you. We'll listen in. I have to practice it though before I do it. The Girl Scouts have an unusual problem this year. Unsold cookies, 15 million boxes to be exact. The organization says the coronavirus is the main culprit. As the pandemic wore into the spring selling season, many troops nixed their traditional cookie booths for safety reasons. The Girl Scouts normally sells around 200 million boxes of cookies a year. And finally tonight in Iowa, a grandmother who reads bedtime stories is making the rounds online. Grandma Betty, as she's known by her Facebook followers, is helping children of all ages relax before bedtime. Tizia Muzinga has the story. Before you say goodnight and it's time for bed. Guess how much I love you? The kissing hand. Grandma Betty goes through her favorite children's books scattered in her living room with colorful stuffed animals to set up the stage. Little Red Riding Hood, Bunny's book of best stories. I'll go back and read some of those. And she finally picks the perfect tale to read to her fans at night. You are special. This is the one where the dots fall off. And at the very end, you are precious in his sight. But when Grandma Betty starts reading, it's more than the stuffed animals listening. Her stories reach nearly 400 fans on Facebook. Her granddaughter Haley captures every word, every story, all on her Excuse phone and post it. Like no matter the age, that. both children and adults tune in every week. Oh my, Dewey thought, what should I do now? And of course. Wait, I have to put my glasses on so I can be on page three. The 83 year old who loves to rock a green eye shadow always gets into character. No, said his sister. It's Dewey, read more books. Dewey squirmed. It's safe to say Grandma Betty understands the assignment just to make you laugh Click, clack, and move. smile before you sleep. Look, Nathan, said his mommy. There is a cat in the library. Like any loving grandmother would. And some of the people who have said they have lost their mom or their grandma come and would give me a hug. And they cried and I cheered up for them too and everything. I said, well, if I can help you, I'll be happy to be a Grandma Betty for you. Oh, so sweet. That was Tizzy and Muzinga reporting. Now you can join Grandma Betty for a bedtime story. Just head over to Facebook and search Stories with Grandma. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.